Will you join me in prayer? A gracious and loving God, you turn the tables in the temple. And we pray that we would have the courage and the openness and honesty enough to let you turn the tables among us this day. To let your prophetic spirit into this space, into our hearts. That we would see and follow you all the way to the cross. All this in the name of Christ. Amen. So we've taken a text this week that typically I don't preach on very often. As I was preparing my sermon, I realized I went back for old notes. I couldn't find any. I went online looking for commentaries. There were fewer than normal. And I realized it's because this is a text that normally appears during Holy Week. So this is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is a story that takes place right after Palm Sunday, but before Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so it kind of gets lost in the shuffle, if you will. And so it's a, it's a familiar story, though. We know it, a little bit about it, but maybe you've not heard a lot of preaching about it. And I know I've not done a lot of preaching about it, just simply because of where it falls in the narrative flow of things. It's a story of Jesus going into the outer courts of the temple, all part of the temple complex. And what he encounters there and what he sees there are the, are the money changers, those who are exchanging coins so that people can pray, pay their, their temple offering or the temple tax. And he's also driving out those who are in the livestock business. They've got doves and pigeons and, and lambs and all kinds of animals to be sacrificed there in the temple. And so it's like a, a, like a market vendor out there. And Jesus goes in and clears that, that whole space in a fit of rage. So when we were in... Um, when we were in Oberammergau last summer, which is where the Passion Play takes place every 10 years, or every 10 years plus two in the, in the case of a pandemic, um, we were there to spend the whole day in Oberammergau, this village that's been putting on this play for centuries now in thanksgiving to God and as their act of offering. We were there to explore the village and then to sit for a five-hour Passion Play, kind of the, all of Holy Week in one sitting, if you will kind of all, of all of the life of Jesus. And, and after we went into the play, it's so long that you have to take a break for dinner. They give you a two hour dinner break. Uh, it's a wonderful experience, but it is also a test of endurance. It's all in German too, but I, did I mention that, right? You're, so you're reading the subtext the whole time and translating, so it's, you gotta really wanna be there, right? So we get to intermission and we meet our tour guide who's been with us for our whole time uh, in Austria and Bavaria and Germany there. His name was Simon and I love Simon. Simon had this great edge about him. He was kind of like a nicer version of Simon Cowell. He was from Eng England originally, lived in Austria. He had this great sense of humor, kind of a, a wit about him that I really appreciated. So he pulled me aside right away after the first act of the show. And he said, Ron, knowing that I was the pastor and leader of the group, he said, what do you think about Jesus? A bit angry, don't you think? And it's so funny because that was exactly my impression from the first act. This Jesus was mad. This Jesus was defiant. This Jesus was taken on the authorities, kind of like the Jesus we see in this scripture text today. And there's nothing wrong with that portrayal of Jesus because that's certainly a part of Jesus's persona, right? That is a part of who Jesus is. This story is part of the bigger narrative of his life. But that was not how Jesus approached most of life. I, I, I came away feeling like if Jesus was like that all the time, he would have no followers at all, right? And, and the crowds would not be drawn to him because he had this other side, this compassionate side, this side that welcomed in strangers, this side that made everyone feel loved, everyone feel included. And so like Simon, I shared a little bit of my uneasiness with the angry Jesus. Apparently if we had gone the next day, we would get to see the other guy that plays Jesus and he plays it in a slightly more balanced way. But we didn't, we saw the angry Jesus. We are seeing the angry Jesus today. One of the few instances we have in all the gospels where Jesus is just downright mad, downright angry, and he has every reason to be. 
He goes into Jerusalem and he goes into the temple and really he's in the outer courts. He's kind of in the Gentile court, it's called. And he began to drive out those who were selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He was teaching and saying, and this is why he's so mad, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You have made it a den of robbers. You've turned it into something it was never supposed to be. You've taken and you've placed a barrier between these people that are coming to the temple to worship God and somehow you are taking advantage of them. And so Jesus is mad. He's angry. And he lets it be known with this uh, profound demonstration of that righteous indignation. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. Because now not only is this man who's gathering crowds around him, gathering followers around him, now he's coming in and disrupting the goings-on in the sacred temple. And they begin to look for a way to kill him. And then Jesus and his disciples, they just kind of leave town. They get out of Jerusalem for the evening. It's not yet. Not yet. But it's coming. So what is it that Jesus does in this prophetic act? Well, first of all, I think Jesus is turning the tables on the profiteers and the power brokers. I don't think Jesus had a, a fight with all of Judaism. Sometimes we can read the Gospels and think he was against everything from the tradition. He wasn't. And he wasn't against everybody's, uh, all the other rabbis. He wasn't. He had a lot in common with them. But what he did oppose consistently, the things that really ticked Jesus off, and did you ever think you'd hear that in a sermon? The things that really made Jesus mad were the hypocrisy that he saw among the leadership. And when he saw people being taken advantage of in the name of God. You see, the, the mention of the, of the animals to be sacrificed in there were the doves. And you know who bought the doves for a sacrifice? It was the poor. That was the poor person's offering. And in the temple courts, in that place just outside the temple, the cost of everything was up. You, you know what it's like to go into Camden Yards, right? And you buy concessions there? See, the reality was, if people had bought their... their doves and their pigeons and their other things outside of the temple courts, just in Jerusalem or the surrounding villages, it would have been way less expensive. Kind of like me buying my two hot dogs and my Coke for six bucks before I go into the stadium, right? But here in the official business of the temple, they are gouging the people, taking advantage of them because they have the captive audience. They know they need these, these things to bring in and make the proper sacrifice. And the money changers, oh, they're doing their part too. The intent was good. The intent was to take these coins with pagan gods or these gods or, the, or even Caesar on them and turn them into to coins that were acceptable and purer to be put into the temple treasury. So the impulse was good, but it had turned into a huge money-making business. And so they were skimming off the top. It was not an even exchange. They were making money on every single person coming into the temple. And so who Jesus is taking on in this story, it's not everybody or everything about Judaism. He's taking on the profiteers and the power brokers. Jesus has a lot, he had a lot more uh, antagonism toward those who were enmeshed in the power structures and who were using that power in some way to lord it over the people and somehow keep them away from the true worship of God. That's who Jesus was upset with. Jesus turned the tables in other parts of his ministry as well, not just in this moment. Jesus was always turning the tables when you think about it, right? Wasn't Jesus turning the tables around the traditions of the law? Consistently he did that. He would say, you have heard it said, but I say to you, right? You have heard it said, the tradition that you've inherited was this, but let me tell you, don't even get angry. It's not just enough not to kill, but don't get angry. You've heard it said, he challenges the Sabbath laws, right? He is he's taken to task for that because he heals a man on the Sabbath. And he asks them, what in the world are you doing with your Sabbath laws if I can't do good on the Sabbath? So he tries to demonstrate a reclaiming of the Sabbath and the Sabbath's true purposes. When his disciples pluck a little grain 
as they're walking through the fields and they're hungry on the Sabbath. And people say, ah, 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 you can't do that on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, was man made for the Sabbath or the Sabbath made for man? And so he was constantly reinterpreting and turning the tables on their traditions and some of the things that they had been taught and some of the heavy load that had been placed upon them. The Ten Commandments that had become 613 or 616 commandments throughout the Torah and throughout early Judaism. You know, when Jesus says to the, to the crowd and to his disciples, he says, take my yoke upon you, for I only give you light burdens, he's specifically talking about his role as a rabbi. Did you know that? You know, we love that passage because it means it, it makes us feel like Jesus is in it with us, right? That Jesus is sharing our burdens, and I think that's true too. But as a rabbi, your yoke was your teachings. And so Jesus is saying, take my teachings upon you, and not this big pile of teachings that are weighing you down and preventing you from a fuller relationship with God. Take my teachings with you, which are distilled to this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do these things, all the law is fulfilled. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. My burden is light. Jesus turns the tables consistently around understandings of what the law is and what is required of them, required of us even. And Jesus even turns the tables on our view of God and our view of neighbor, our view of the whole world, really. Because in a world that is built on hierarchies, right, and a climbing to power, Jesus turns the tables and says, no, the last will be first. And the first will be last. The greatest among you aren't the ones who lord it over other people. The greatest among you are the servants among you. And Jesus didn't just talk about it. He embodied that, right? Jesus took some of our, our understanding of God as a judge who was distant and far and brings God down to us as a God of reckless love. A God who chases us down. A God who, like we heard in the parable two weeks ago, a God like that father who runs out to meet us, a God whose heart always goes toward us. And Jesus reinterpreted and turned the tables on the definition of even who neighbor was, right? Who, the, who the, our neighbor was that we were to love. You remember that story of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan we call that story? That is occasioned by a young lawyer who stands up to him, and he's a teacher of the law, and he stands up to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gives, and Jesus says, what, what do you think? And he says, love God, love, love your neighbor. And, and then Jesus is done, says, do this and you'll live. And he says, oh, but, 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 but who's my neighbor? And then he tells that famous story, right? That famous story about the man who falls among robbers and a priest and a Levite just walk by on the other side. They don't come off looking too good. And he out, most outlandishly and outrageously, we've lost the edge of this, he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. He takes the outsider and makes him the, the insider. You know, Jesus was always doing that, wasn't he? One of the other charges against Jesus, why they were so mad at Jesus, was he hung around all the wrong kind of people, the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus just saw people. Jesus just saw people, Jesus especially saw those who had been mistreated, those who had been put in boxes, those who had been judged, and he reached out to them, and he invited them in and said, those are our neighbors. Those are the ones that we should love. And let's not even go where Jesus turns the tables to say that we don't just love our neighbors, who are we supposed to love? Our enemies. The people we don't get along with. The people who are hardest to love. Jesus says, love them too. Jesus is always, always turning the tables on our expectations and our understandings of who God is and who we are in relationship with each other. I love this cartoon I came across this week. It's how Jesus became meek and mild because we have a very fiery Jesus before us, don't we? Woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. Like I said, Jesus often condemned hypocrisy more than anything else in his, in his teaching. When he did have conflict with people, it was, about, it was about important things. And Jesus, stop. You're not respecting your elders and those in authority. And then Jesus says, of course, this is right there in the Bible. Oh, I'm so sorry, I sincerely apologize. Mea culpa, my bad, won't happen again. How could I have been so rude? That is not in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> right? 
Jesus confronted the powers and the authorities when he needed to. And he reached out to the lost and the lonely when he needed to do that as well. And he invites us all in to this radical way of loving and living. I think they would do, we would do well if we would think of Jesus less like the fiery preacher in Footloose. How many of you recognize that scene even before I told you? And a little bit more like Kevin Bacon who brings all that joy and life to the party. Maybe looking at Jesus a little less like this. The way we sometimes portray him in Sunday school lessons and on church walls and through the art of the ages of the church. Jesus meek and mild and a little bit more like this. <laughs> Jesus the rebel with a cause. Jesus the one who comes to disrupt things. Jesus the one who comes to stir things up. Jesus the one who comes to change everything, to take on the status quo, because the status quo will never save us. Jesus the rebel with a cause. I saw Meg early this morning. I said, Meg, we missed an opportunity because there's a song I had thought about at the beginning of Lent. It's called The Rebel. And I've sung it before. I've actually sung it once here. And I've sung it before in other churches <laughs> with a woman beside me in a leather jacket. And we kind of came out like this, kind of out of character a little bit, unless you see me in character like this. And then we can talk about that. <laughs> but there's a song I, I, I learned about 20 years ago by a, a local Christian artist. He was from Texas. He, he was singing at a, con at a conference that I was attending. And, doing some teaching at, and he, uh, he sang this song that just captured my heart and as continues to sing in my heart to this day, and it starts like this. On the day he rode in, there were folks on the street. The rebel wore black like all rebels do. They didn't much notice they were hurrying nowhere. He could have moved on, but he had work to do. Who was he? Where did he come from? How did he do it? Where did he go? Who was he? Where did he come from? How did he do it? Where did he go? Second verse picks up these words. The people would stop to hear the fire in his words, the fiery preacher. His eyes blazed out with a strength and a passion they never had heard from the preachers in town. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus seemed to be teaching with an authority that other people didn't have. And then it comes to this crescendo as, as the people start to get worried, the people in power. So the preacher and sheriff, they paid him a visit. Move on or we'll move you was all they would say. But the rebel pressed on, had to finish his story. He could see through their mask all the way through their pain. And then the story moves on through the rest of Holy Week, his crucifixion and his resurrection. But this is the rebel Jesus who comes to save the world, not just the nice Jesus. The nice Jesus would never have been crucified, would he? Jesus is nice, don't get me wrong. Jesus' revolution is a revolution of love at his heart. In the end, the message of Jesus is that love is stronger than even death. Love is stronger than any other form of power. That's how he really turns the tables, isn't it? And the question for all of us today is to not let this be just a story from the past where Jesus is messing things up in the temple. But will you let Jesus turn the tables in your life? Disrupt your heart and your values and your decisions. Are you willing to follow the rebel Jesus all the way to the cross? I am. And I hope you'll join me. Amen. Amen.